Hi, and welcome to our fourth Universalist service video. My name is Imber Kelly. I'm the Director of Religious Education here at the Fourth Universalist Society, and I use she and her pronouns. Thank you so much for joining us today. What follows are selections from our service on March 6, 2022. In this video, you'll get to hear the reading and the reflection. Following that, we have a lively discussion where we go a little bit deeper into some of the service themes together. You're invited to check out our video and our audio podcast each week. We post it on our website, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, as well as many of your favorite podcast streaming sites. If you like what you see, we hope you give us a positive review. The likes, the comments, the sharing, subscribing, this helps spread Fourth Universalist media further. Finally, we acknowledge that our land is located on, our community is located on the land of the Munse Lenape peoples. With this acknowledgement, we seek to continue the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of oppression. We invite you to join us in this work as well as we work to embrace the Eighth UU principle. Thank you again for watching. We begin with our reading. Fifteenth chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, starting at the 29th verse. After Jesus had left the district of Tyre and Sidon, he passed through the Sea of Galilee, and he went up the mountain where he sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the maimed, the blind, the mute, and many others. They put them at his feet, and he cured them, so that the crowd was amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. Here ends the reading. We live in a remarkable world where not only do the mortal bodies of humans, the other animals, the birds, and the fish get viruses, but our digital devices can get infected by computer viruses too. Whether digital or biological, whether originating in a computer lab or a scientific research lab, viruses operate by rapidly proliferating in a host whose system is modified and the virus uses the host to replicate and then infect other hosts. Our not so distant forebears would have been amazed, not just by the concept of a digital virus, but by biological viruses, since germ theory wasn't discovered until the 1860s by the French chemist Louis Pasteur, which then led to the discovery of viruses specifically in the 1890s. For centuries, educated people believed that illness was caused by miasma, which is to say that sickness was passed on to others through inhaling noxious, polluted air. According to this theory, an epidemic would be caused by bad odors emanating from something going rotten. Miasma theory, leading to its logical conclusion, eventually came to serve as an explanation even for other conditions, like the belief that obesity was caused by inhaling the odor of food. Though miasma theory was popular for centuries, there were some cultural exceptions in history. For example, in ancient Judea, in the Law of Moses, there seems to be evidence of the understanding that diseases could be spread by close contact with others, which is why the Mosaic Law includes practices such as keeping quarantine and practicing hygiene in relation to both leprosy and venereal diseases. The ancient Indian physician, Sushruta, who lived eight centuries before the Common Era, also hypothesized that diseases like leprosy, eye infections, fevers, and tuberculosis were spread by close contact with someone whether through physical and skin-to-skin -skin contact 
or eating together or sitting together or sleeping together or sharing clothes or cosmetics with one another. The ways we have thought about illness have certainly evolved through the centuries. And though more research continues to be done on the nature of pathogens, for as long as human civilization has created systems of religion and systems of writing, a central concern among all people was the issue of health and physical well being. People in every age have recognized that physical health and well being, which includes eating good food, drinking clean water, breathing clean air, having adequate shelter, having weather appropriate clothing, and the absence of disease or pain is foundational to human flourishing, and that unless these basic needs are met, then higher needs will not be able to be achieved. It's for this reason that religions throughout time have offered their adherents ways of coping with the difficulty of living in our bodies. Our bodies, which are vulnerable to disease, pain, injuries, impairments, aging, and eventually going back to the earth. A religious response to these universal human issues took place in different ways in different cultures. In ancient Egypt, for example, where most deaths were caused by waterborne parasites or malaria, the priests and doctors were often one and the same person, and treatment included a mix of magic, aromas, chanting, lucky charms, and herbs. The priests encouraged people to practice good hygiene by bathing with water frequently, shaving off one's body hair, and practicing circumcision. Because of the complex Egyptian practice of the mummification of the dead, doctors there developed an understanding of human anatomy, including of the skeletal system. And so doctors were able to do minor surgeries like fixing broken bones and stitching wounds. In ancient Greece, healing temples were dedicated to Asclepius, the god of medicine, whose followers would go on pilgrimages to his temples to seek spiritual and physical healing. Treatment included baths, a cleansing diet, and sleeping in the temple and waiting for a deity to speak to the patient in a dream by telling the patient what treatment is needed to cure the condition. Two of the great doctors from the ancient world, Galen and Hippocrates, both got their medical training at the healing temples of Asclepius. While the healing practices of the Egyptians and Greeks would have been known to the people who lived in ancient Israel, they had their own practices. You may remember that a few weeks ago, I preached a sermon about prophets. In the ancient Near East, prophets didn't just predict the future or share divine messages. Because they were believed to have a close connection with the Most High, they were also seen as agents of healing. In that culture, there was a scarcity of physicians as well as a scarcity of money to pay the physicians, so that accessing medical help was a great burden for most people. If a person was identified as being a prophet or a healer, crowds would gather around that person to ask him to heal as many people as possible. Religious healings were a common feature of that culture, and when a prophet was identified, the first thing which was expected of him was that he would heal the sick, the lame, the maimed, the blind, and the mute. As we heard in the reading this morning, the people of Galilee identified Jesus of Nazareth as both a prophet and a healer, a kind of physician of both bodies and souls. The healing and compassionate touch of Jesus on the sick was a central feature of his ministry and was consistent with the social and cultural expectations of someone in his role. 
While those of us who live today in our culture are appropriately skeptical of medical treatment which isn't evidence-based, and while even in the first centuries of the Common Era, there were Greco-Roman pagan writers who were critical of stories of Jesus's healing abilities, who said that he likely learned how to heal from Egyptian magicians. Nevertheless, stories of healing abound throughout the New Testament by its various authors, which indicates to me that the religious vision of Jesus was less concerned about saving souls to go to heaven and more about healing bodies bodies that could participate in society and contribute to the welfare of the community, bodies which could give praise to the Most High, bodies which would one day be resurrected in the kingdom of God on earth. Bodies mattered a lot to Jesus and to those who followed him and those who wrote about him after his death. Throughout the ages, while Christian churches continue to value healing ministry and while many of the greatest medical centers in our region and in our country have religious foundations, what I want to tell you more about today is about a place on the other side of our globe where people have been going to for healing for centuries, a place most of us don't know about, but whose tradition invokes both mystery and wonder. In this place, the beliefs and practices which characterize the attitudes towards healing in the ancient Near East and which are consistent with the early beliefs about Jesus are still in practice to this day. The place I'm referring to is in Baghdad, Iraq, a place that most of us know about in the context of the two wars our country fought there a place with ongoing sectarian divisions and summertime temperatures which have reached 122 degrees Fahrenheit in recent years due to climate change. Despite all of the challenges of living in contemporary Baghdad and despite all the centuries of change and conflicts there, for over 1200 years, pilgrims in search of healing have made their way to a shrine which claims to contain the tomb of the Old Testament character of Joshua, who was Moses' assistant and later his successor, and who is best known for his victory in the Battle of Jericho. Joshua is also revered by Muslims and is mentioned in Islamic literature outside of the Quran. While there's no archeological evidence which proves the existence of Joshua, nor any evidence which proves that his tomb is actually in Baghdad. And while there are competing tombs of Joshua in Iran, Israel, Jordan, and Turkey, the hope for healing from the long dead religious figure compels many to seek out his tomb for restoration. The Canadian journalist Jane Araf wrote about the tomb last year and described it as being in a crowded neighborhood in Baghdad, down the road from a railway yard. If you're at home, you can find photographs of the tomb and shrine online on your computer, or if you're here in person, you could search for photos on your smartphone. The shrine is maintained by a woman named Um Junaid, whose late husband came from a family who were guardians of the shrine for six centuries. She is a devout woman who never learned how to read, but who memorized the entire Quran by heart and who considers it a privilege to be able to care for this shrine. She told the journalist that she has little interest in the outside world where people are preoccupied with irrelevant and superficial concerns like buying new furniture or purchasing a new car. She told the journalist that when I open the prophet's door at night, I find many birds on his tomb. They stay the night with him and they leave in the morning. These birds are angels. She also spoke of the legend of a serpent who is alleged to come out of a crack in the ancient wood of the prophet's tomb and which protects the shrine at night. During the daytime, the reptile is said to meander around the neighborhood to protect it. 
and people who live in the neighborhood claim to hear the serpent slithering, but never actually see it. Um Junaid said, this land is blessed and has secrets. Some things are obvious and some things are not obvious. We cannot answer everything. On a typical day at the shrine, a married couple with their two children arrived by taxi to seek healing. The wife in the couple had been suffering from pain and weakness due to a herniated disc in her spine, which no doctors had been able to treat. Um Junaid recited Quranic verses having to do with healing over the woman's body and instructed her to recite a verse, a certain verse 30 times every day at home. Afterward, the woman placed her hand on the velvet fabric which covers Joshua's tomb and prayed. Later in the day, a government representative came to the shrine with his daughter and two sons to pray for healing for his sick wife. The man's ancestors are buried in a cemetery nearby where palm trees, heavy with dates, cast shadows on the tombstones. When asked why he visited the shrine, he said, our grandfather said the prophet Joshua is buried there. The prophets are known from generation to generation. Later, another man wearing a military uniform and whose knee was broken and bandaged, causing him to limp, went to the tomb, laid his rifle on the carpet and prayed for healing. Another man wearing a knit white prayer cap who spends his days studying the teachings of the mystical Sufi tradition of Islam visited the shrine to pay his respects to the prophet. Witnessing all these visitors, Um Junaid comments, this is the medicine for the world of believers. Here at our congregation, we don't have the benefit of pilgrims or prophets. And unfortunately, no amount of prayerful supplications have managed to end the COVID-19 pandemic or any of the other debilitating conditions that many live with. With universal health care as a public policy priority remains controversial in our country, we are nevertheless fortunate to have access to talented physicians, psychiatrists, dentists, and others in the healing professions whose treatments give people an opportunity to live a longer and healthier life. What then can our faith tradition offer for our healing? We don't expect prayer to mend a broken knee or a broken bone, but I've seen how faith and prayer can mend a broken heart. Research studies have shown that prayer and meditation invoke a relaxation response in our bodies, which alleviates stress, calms the body, promotes healing and relief, increases optimism, and offers a sense of hope and meaning. Besides that, our faith offers community, particularly a caring community, where our joys are amplified and our sorrows are lessened. For those reasons and more, I'm glad that we don't have to travel halfway across the world to find that, since we have it right here in our midst. Reverend Mark, it's so good to get to sit down with you on this big occasion of our first weekend returning to multi-platform. Uh, it's great to have you today. Likewise, good to meet with you, Amber, as always. Yes, and uh, as people may notice, my background, Reverend Mark's background, are not at the church. We are, in fact, pre-recording this uh, because we had to figure out what was the easiest way to fit this into uh, schedules as we return to multi-platform. Yes, thank you for your flexibility, Amber. Uh, I thought that this message was fascinating in so many different directions. Um, uh, oh gosh, what, where do I even want to start? I, I think one of the things that first came to me, um, uh, especially like talking about like biblical miracles, talking about like people in, um, that are believing maybe some of these more like superstitious type of miracles, um, 
and you know, I say that with much respect as someone who also sometimes has my own superstitions, knock on wood. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, you know, that there's been a lot of conversation, especially in a lot of theological circles about like a lot of the, the ableism that kind of stands uh, behind like this concept that, that Jesus, that the church, that these healers, that they needed to heal these broken people, that uh, something was inherently wrong with them that needed to be fixed. Has that something, been something you've encountered in your theological studies? Well, you know, I, I think um, that what you're discussing is kind of a new development in terms of, you know, these, these voices, uh, you know, discussing these issues. It is kind of new, so it wasn't part of my formal training, but it's something I've heard about and read about. Um, I think it's important to keep context uh, in mind. So, you know, one of the words that I use in my sermon besides healing is restoration. And I think for the people at the time that these scriptures were written, what would restoration look like? And so for those people, restoration of um, the blind, the mute, the lame, the uh, maimed, et cetera, uh, would look like uh, the blind seeing again, um, the maimed being able to walk, the mute being able to speak. That's what um, restoration looked like at that time. In this time, uh, in our current context, we can uh, create restoration through creating uh, ways for people to participate in society, regardless of whether, uh, regardless of their body's status, right? And so I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, what restoration looked like 2000 years ago is different from what restoration could look like today. There are also ways that we create restoration today that people 2000 years ago could have only dreamed of whether through um, medical technologies or social changes. Um, I know I've read things about, um, you know, in the contemporary Middle East um, about how, uh, you know, they're kind of just starting to get, um, you know, an awareness about uh, what people who are differently abled need. So, um, you know, in a lot of, of these cities, for example, I remember hearing a report about in Egypt um, where on the sidewalks, there's no um, kind of like ramp uh, to get, you know, from the street onto the sidewalk. So if you are in a wheelchair, for example, if you use a wheelchair, you cannot really go out in public or participate in society because how will you even cross the street? You, you know, unless someone, you know, helps you with it, um, you can't really be very independent. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of, that's the take uh, that I have on it is you know, looking at context. Right, well, you know, I think that makes sense that it's also important to understand it in the historical context. And it's important for us to not then just copy and paste the same beliefs onto our ourselves that, you know, we have these different abilities to recognize things differently and to see things differently and to understand uh, a holistic life in a whole different way. Um, but, you know, the, the, and if anything, though, I think that because you talk about, you know, how the message is kind of that Jesus uh, and that the ministry of Jesus appreciated bodies. And I know yes. incarnation and like the concept of incarnation is uh, in my, my theological paper that I'm working on for ordination. It's, 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 the, it's a featured topic. Um, because it's a fascinating concept for me. Um, yeah. And that is counter to a lot of these um, theological beliefs that most, most of those theological beliefs stem from the idea that everybody is pretty much inherently evil, like the original sin and its impact on the body. Um, whereas, you know, the incarnation says, God wanted to be human, like, and wanted to experience body, and that Jesus's ministry wanted to heal bodies, like, and not treat them as unimportant, which is actually counter to, to, um, you know, ableism, to recognizing that, that divinity resides within each of our physical existence. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, for me personally, I will say I'm, I don't believe in the incarnation. That's, uh, I'm kind of a classic Unitarian and that's actually what brought me to Unitarianism from uh, Trinitarian, uh, you know, uh, Christianity is that I, I stopped believing in the incarnation. But having said that, um, I do think it's really important as someone who reads the scripture that, um, Jesus is really, you know, very concerned with human bodies. He, um, you know, again, whether it's through, for example, like 
the belief in the resurrection, right? Whatever we individually believe about that particular doctrine, um, Jesus rose from the dead. And his the idea was not just that Jesus rose from the dead and therefore we who believe in him can go to heaven. That's really kind of a corruption of, of that uh, idea, of that doctrine. The original thought uh, in the first century was that, well, because Jesus rose from the dead, therefore the community of believers would rise from the dead as well, physically, bodily, um, you know, the earth is going to be reimagined, paradise will be regained, uh, heaven on earth, and what does that look like? Human bodies uh, that are restored, a kind of a, re a, a restoration. Um, again, whether we believe in that or not today, that, that's fine. But just to say that I think the historical Jesus really was concerned with the well-being of people's bodies because they, we live in our bodies. Um, you know, we are, we are spiritual beings and we have consciousness, but we live in these bodies. We can't really escape them. And, um, you know, the ancient Hebrews had a very holistic view of ourselves. They really did um, have... You know, they didn't really think of like the soul as being separate from the body. Um, again, whether, you know, whatever we think about that is fine. But I think just to look at to the historical context, I think it's it's fascinating to to think about it that way. Uh, and, you know, I think that it also gives us a, a call as you use um, that that we can look at ways that we can advocate for better taking care of bodies, whether that's fighting um, for um, a society that, that is structured in a way that includes uh, people with disabilities, that a society that has healthcare, which includes people who don't have infinite resources and money, um, that this is a way that we can begin to also be thinking about how we care for each other in the bodily form. Absolutely. I do think that there is a moral component to these issues that we're debating in our society. I think um, you know, in some sense, some of these things are controversial in our society and some of these things aren't. Um, you know, I think most, if not all Americans agree that people who are living with disabilities should be afforded equal rights and equal access. And, you know, the fact that the American with Disabilities Act passed in the early 90s under a Republican administration, I think is significant. And I, it's pretty much settled law. I don't think anyone's saying like, yeah, we should take away those rights. Um, so that's good news. But we also live in a society where um, universal access to health care is really controversial. And um, among people who do agree that there should be universal health care. We don't really agree on how we should provide universal health care. There's many different theories on how that should be. And, you know, we kind of agree to disagree on it. But, um, you know, un unfortunately, I was just hearing, you know, this week, and, and I, you know, uh, agree with this personally, that um, it's a little bit disappointing that um, with the people who are in power right now, you know, in Washington, that there's really no discussion at this time of moving forward with any type of uh, universal health care, again, whatever that would look like. Um, it's like it's something that people campaign about, but then when they're actually in power, it's either it seems too hard to enact or the will is not there, or maybe, I don't know if the money's not there, I really don't know. Um, but it, it is a bit of a disappointment. I do think that, you know, like I said, there is a moral um, call to action to make sure that people have the right to health care. Um, but we just can't really seem to agree on that as a society, our society right now, uh, on whether that should be a right, and if so, how we should enact that. So the conversation continues, you know, let's see where it goes, but uh, it's definitely an ongoing conversation. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time today to sit down with me. Absolutely, my pleasure. <laughs>